Every once in a while you get one that reverts back and they end up on land like this and then they turn into a terrestrial salamander. So this is Harlo and we're supposed to look like that but one of our genes made us turn into this. They go through metamorphosis like a frog. And Carlo lives with us as a rescue because he's a really good ambassador to show people what salamanders look like. Pennsylvania has a lot of different salamanders. These guys are actually a type of tiger salamander, which we used to have in PA, but they're extricated, which means they're extinct from Pennsylvania. But they used to get about this big. Um, we have spotted salamanders and stuff that all get about this size. But yeah, he comes out for education tours and people can see what a chubby little salamander he is. <laughs> he's a cool dude. That's an Oscar. Snapper? Yeah. That's the common snapper that's on Yeah. They got a long reach, man. <laughs> and then, uh, this is the grump. This is Oscar. Wow. Nice. It's the guy that drowned. <laughs> What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool thing. You see the little pink thing in his mouth? Yeah, yeah. That's his tongue. Underwater, it looks like a worm. It looks like a worm. When he's hungry, he sits there and he opens his mouth and he just wiggles the tongue. And in the wild, if like oh, fish or like smaller turtles see it, they go in the mouth to get the worm and he like, <laughs> slam shot. does it, but that's why we just the little shell. Yeah. I know. I hope they have fish jerky shell. Like, crazy. And you don't go out on the table because I don't trust people not to put fingers in there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi. hi! How are you guys doing? We helped him carry the stuff up. Oh, thanks. I was trying to run back to see what he was doing. We could done. see the end lot of people here, so. We got, I was like, I think we've got to be around somewhere. He was back to his country. Yeah, we were. We got a mess. Oh, nice. That's popcorn. She's a corn snake. Very cool. I got a red so this is a useful way to use lantern flies to make pins out of them <laughs> Dress is like him. <laughs> it's just a little <laughs> I just can't have you guys come back this far. So you can always stand up there. You can see them right through the table. That's I think we're. Yeah, let's go in the. Sorry, I yelled through both of Let's go up here. We can take it. The one you showed us last. I like that. I have backyard chickens. Oh, yes. And something similar to that was above the yeah, chickens. Yeah, they will go after chickens. They do? Yeah. yeah, I shouldn't take them out of the cage. They should stay in the cage. Well, I mean, if you are there to watch yeah, them, I was like, actually, right you, okay. you should be good because they're not going to. Usually they're not going to fly down here there because they, they see you as like something dangerous. So they're like, okay. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Yeah, so. I was donated her and her brother from someone who runs a rescue for them, and she has a genetic defect. Yeah, this is the one that's in the med center, right? Yeah. She's in the med center. Yeah, she has a genetic defect that causes her to go through metamorphosis like a normal salamander. So she's technically an axolotl. She's still going to stay in the salamander. Yeah, she's like. So she's like an axolotl. I mean, yeah, she's an axolotl pretending to be a spot in salamander, basically. No, she means like because normal axolotls they basically stay in their tadpole stage the whole night, and they got the big fluffy gills and everything. It just it's a very rare like thing that like it turns the gene back on because it's naturally turned off in axolotls. Yeah. Or rescue um, captive animals. Or they are patients that we have had come in that can't go back out to the wild for one reason or another. So they live with us full time at ARC and they're used to being around people. However, they are still wild animals. 
and they're not going to act like your dogs and cats and stuff. Um, it's very easy to spook them or upset them. So big one is when we take out an animal, we want to make sure that we try to be nice and quiet because if I pull out an animal and you all get excited or scared, start screaming at it, do you think, yeah, like that, <laughs> do you think that they're going to want to stay and hang out with us? No, they're going to get freaked out and be like, oh my God, there's a bunch of crazy people here. I'm going back in the box. Um, so we want to be nice and quiet. If you have any questions, um, I try to save questions till after I'm done talking about that specific animal. You can raise your hands. I'll try to get as many questions as I can. Um, the one other big thing is once you guys got a seat, try to keep your seat. You don't want to get up and rush the animal because they might think that you're coming to get them. Remember, they are wild animals, so they do have instincts telling them like hey there's predators out there so if they see a bunch of kids get up and run at them they go oh no this is the end um <laughs> so we're gonna be nice and quiet and try to stay in our seats all right so before i get started do we have any questions hmm? no stay all right seat. so oh stay i saw one seat. hand up no yes do you, do you have a question no. All right, okay. we'll come back to you. <laughs> Good practice. <laughs> All right, so I will go and grab our first critter. <laughs> so this here, this is popcorn. And popcorn is a corn snake. So, corn snakes are a non-venomous species of snake. And they are actually not native to Pennsylvania. Um, they are a very popular pet in the pet trade. And that's actually how popcorn came to us. She was actually, uh, someone had her as a pet. They actually were taking really good care of her. But unfortunately, that person was going through medical issues. Uh, by the time I was got in contact with her, she was wheelchair bound and she was having a really hard time getting in and taking care of popcorn. So she was looking for a good home for her. And at the time, we had our own ambassador corn snake that he had recently passed away. He was 17. So that's a very, very old corn snake. Um, but he had passed away due to like age related issues and we were looking for a new snake and we ended up getting in contact. She was thrilled that Popcorn was gonna come, uh, with up, come live with us and be able to help teach people about snakes. So, like I was just saying, corn snakes are not native to Pennsylvania. They are, however, native to New Jersey. They are native to Maryland, Delaware, and West Virginia. So basically all our neighbors but us. And the really comical thing about it is there are areas um, along the Pennsylvania border where their range literally comes right up to the state border and for whatever reason they do not go into Pennsylvania. Um, they most, but usually animals don't care about human-made borders. Apparently this situation they do. But what corn snakes do have is they have a relative that you can find here in Pennypack and in most of Pennsylvania and that is the eastern or black rat snake. So Corn snakes are a type of rat snake themselves. They also have the nickname the red rat snake due to their coloration. As you can imagine, the black rat snake is what color do you think? Black. It's a black snake, yes. Now they are actually Pennsylvania's longest snake species. Um, they're probably not the heaviest. I'd say that's probably the timber rattlesnake, which we don't have in Penny Pack. But um, black rat snakes, they can, the really big ones on record, can push the eight foot mark. So it's like a very, it's a considerably long snake for around here. Uh, popcorn isn't quite that big. She is about four feet long. Now, she shares a lot of things in common with her Pennsylvania relative. Uh, one of those is she is a type of constrictor. Does anyone here know what a constrictor is? Nope, you're pressing Siri. <laughs> yep. That's what I asked. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it is a snake that is non-venomous, and what the way they take down their prey is they grab them and they basically squeeze them. So what these guys eat, as you know, I was mentioning they are a type of rat snake. What do you think they're called rat snakes for? They eat rats. They eat rats. 
Now the name corn snake is a little bit more confusing, but the reason that they're called the corn snake is farmers would actually find these guys in their barns where they store all the grains, so the wheat, the barley, and yes, the corn. And what do you think the snakes were doing in the barns? Eating corn. Eating rice. Do you guys think snakes eat corn? No. no. What does eat corn? Mice. Mice and rats. So Mice these guys were actually in the barn because there were rodents in the barn. And do you think the farmers actually like the snakes being there? Yes. Yeah, because that's free pest control, right? Yeah. And snakes... Yeah, farmers grow corn. You don't want to, if you went through all that work to grow corn, do you want a bunch of mice to come in and eat it? No. No, so it's nice to have the snakes around. Now, snakes are probably one of nature's best mouse traps. And part of that reason is say you had a cat and that cat was chasing a mouse and that mouse ran into a hole. That's, that cat can't do anything, right? He's got to sit there and wait for the mouse to hopefully come out. If you're a snake, what do you do when you're chasing that mouse? Go to the hole. You just go into the hole. And that is actually why snakes have this big long body because that allows them to actually fit into the tight spaces that their prey likes to go. We'll not let her obviously go too high, but if you guys want to see. They are actually able to wedge themselves in between the grooves of the bark. And then they use their belly scales basically to climb straight up the tree. That's pretty impressive for an animal with no legs, right? Yeah. Wow. Alright, come here. So that's out in the wild how a lot of times they are uh, preying on wild bird nests and not so much chicken nests. Yes? Can we touch it or hold it? Um, I, so after the program, I'll be back out in our booth in the parking lot, and if you guys come by, you can well, I can take her out the the petter. It's just there's so many people here. If I let you all pet her, we'll be here for a while. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yes. So snake scales are made out of keratin. So that's the same material that our fingernails and our hair is made out of. All right. Let me make sure no one else has a question. All right. I know, but you already asked once, so I was making sure. All right, what's your question? Okay, are they can swim? So snakes can swim, they're actually really good swimmers. Um, corn snakes can swim well, they don't necessarily like being around the water. However, if you go down to the creek, sometimes you can see snakes down there, and a lot of times those guys are what we call northern water snakes. And they're a native snake, they're completely harmless, but they live in and around the water and they like to eat fish and frogs. All right. Can this size eat a chicken egg? Uh, so this size, she is not quite big enough to eat a chicken egg. Um, at ARC, she does eat like a variety of different foods. And one thing she will eat is sometimes we can get like little quail eggs at the grocery store. She will eat those. And she'll eat like three or four of them in a sitting. All right, so I'm going to put popcorn away and I'm gonna pull out one of our next critters. Remember, guys, want to be nice and quiet. I mean, he's probably going to get pretty cranky with me, anyways. But this here is Elmo. Hi, Elmo. And Elmo is a common snapping turtle. So he is the native snapping turtle species here in Pennsylvania. Um, he is only about two years old. So he's still got some growing to do. They are our largest species of turtle. The largest one we've ever gotten in, in at Ark weighed just under 40 pounds and he was an absolute brute. His, his claws were as big as eagle talons. Um, now these guys unfortunately get a pretty bad reputation. A lot of people don't want to mess or be around snapping turtles. And a lot of people will even go as far as like, oh, there are snapping turtles in that water. I will not go in there because they're going to come flying out of nowhere and bite me. But here is the funny thing with snapping turtles. When they are in the water, 
they are actually very, very peaceful. You can actually go swimming with a snapping turtle, and at most they're probably gonna come and check you out and see what you're doing, or they're gonna swim away. And that is because they are most comfortable in the water. If they feel threatened in the water, they are actually very quick and very agile swimmers, and they'll just get out of there. The reason for them doing the whole snapping thing is when they're on land. So they are obviously not very quick on land, but another thing is if you look at the bottom of a snapping turtle shell, there's not a lot of shell there, is there? And the reason for that is it actually makes them lighter. So when they're in the water, they can swim more quickly. But when they're on land, that offers no protection. If I'm a predator, this is all exposed. So what they've come up with is the best defense is a good offense. So they'll hiss, they open their mouth, they point the back of their shell up like a shield at you, and they'll snap out at you. And that's not them being aggressive, that's them be saying, hey, you're making me feel uncomfortable, please go away, I don't want to be messed with. So, it's, it's just good to know that snapping turtles aren't just big scary monsters that are out to get you, they're just literally want to be left alone. Now, Elmo came to us a little over a year ago, and the way he came to us is someone found him as a little tiny hatchling and decided they were gonna take him home and keep him as a pet. Turtles, in general, are not great pets. They are, they are messy, they live in water, they require really big filters, so it's a lot of work and it's not for everybody. That gets dialed all the way up to 10 when it's a snapping turtle, because everything that makes turtles difficult pets is like tenfold, plus you deal with the fact that they tend to be a little bit on the cranky side. So anytime that they're out of the water, they're gonna let you know. Elmo's actually being pretty good right now. The last show we had earlier, he was not. Um, but after they had him for a while, they realized he was a lot of work and they didn't want him anymore. So they brought him to us. And unfortunately, because of how long he was in captivity, we couldn't release him back out to the wild. So he has stayed with us as an ambassador animal ever since. Now the normal reason that we get snapping turtles in at ARC is they get into a lot of trouble out on the roads. Um, they get hit by cars while they're trying to cross either early in the spring when they're leaving hibernation and trying to go out to different ponds or when the females are coming out of the water to lay eggs. Um, sometimes it surprises me that like, you know, people miss like a big 30 pound turtle sitting in the middle of the road. But there is unfortunately also a pretty high statistic of people that purposely hit them uh, just because people don't like snapping turtles so they see it and they swear to hit them. Now, the way, there are ways you can help them. So this goes to the adults, not the kids. I don't want you guys messing with snapping turtles. But if a snapping turtle or any turtle is crossing the road, one of the best things you can do is you, if it's safe for you to do so, you can stop and help them cross the road. Now, here's a question. If a turtle is crossing the road, what side of the road do you put it on? What? Hmm, not quite, because what if he was leaving that side of the road? Yeah, because if you take him and put him back, you know what he's going to do once you leave? He's going to try to cross again. So you want to put him on the other side of the road. The other thing you don't want to do, if there's like, you go, oh, there's a pond, like, couple miles down the road, I think it'll be really great for him. I'm going to take him and put him there. Do you think that's a good idea? No, a lot of turtles have home ranges that they're really used to, and when you move them around, they're going to try to get back home, or they're going to get really confused about where you put them. So the analogy I like to give is if you see a little old lady trying to cross the road, and you're like, I'm going to help her. Do you throw her in the back of your car, drive her across town, and drop, drop her off somewhere else? No. Uh, so you just help her across, she knows where she's going, hopefully. <laughs> it's the same rule with turtles. Now, the thing with snapping turtles, obviously, compared to other turtles, is they're a little bit more precarious to transport. So, there are some safe ways to handle snapping turtles if you are inclined to help them across the road. One of the easiest ones for people who don't want to mess with them is to kind of nudge them along or get a shovel and kind of push them on their way. Probably not the best way to do it, but it's better than them getting hit by a car, right? 
Now, if you're comfortable enough to try to handle them, there are some important facts. One, these claws are pretty rough, especially when you start getting those big adult turtles. And the other thing with common snapping turtles, they have a very long neck. Um, if I, you don't wanna, no. You're like, I don't care anymore, I'm over it. If they want to, they can flip their head backwards and go almost halfway down their shell. So if you ever see like those pictures or on TV of people handling like the big alligator snappers and they grab them by the front of the shell and they lift them up, if you do that with a common snapping turtle, you're gonna end up with a common snapping turtle attached to your wrist. Um, so with them, all the handling you want to do from the, the back half backwards. Now the two ways I personally like is you can put your hands underneath the shell like this and lift up and they can't get you that way. Oh, now you're mad. However, the big important thing with this, make sure you kind of hold them out because one of the problems is you get kind of comfortable to hold them straight up and then you have a snapping turtle pointing at your face. <laughs> And that's how you get a free piercing. Now, the way my favorite way, and the way I usually do it, is you put one hand underneath. They'll go over the back. They won't go underneath for some reason. That's just what they do. But if you put one hand underneath and one hand on the back like this, and then point them away from you, and then don't point them at anyone you like, <laughs> this is a safe way. And a lot of times, he's starting to do it a little bit. He's not quite big enough. When you get the big guys, they end up just taking their arms and wrapping it around, or their legs, they wrap it around your arms, and they kind of secure themselves there, and they also don't claw you up, so it's kind of nice. This here is Oscar. So we got Elmo and Oscar. There we go. Oscar is a three-year-old alligator snapping turtle. So right away, you'll notice there are definitely some big differences between the two different types of snapping turtles. Their shells, yeah. So the shell is one big difference. So with the common snapping turtles, they have a very smooth shell. And as they get older, it gets even smoother. Really old individuals will have a completely smooth shell. With the alligator snappers, they look like a dinosaur. It's And this stays like that their whole life. It will kind of smooth out a little bit, but they'll always have those big ridges. Now, another big difference is if you look at their heads, gator snappers have a much bigger head, a more pointed beak, and a much bigger mouth. You could probably fit Elmo's whole head in his mouth. Now, another flip is they actually have a really short neck. Oh, uh, there you go. So you're showing off your big long neck. Oh. Alligator snappers, the reason people can grab them and hold them behind the shell right there is they can't actually physically reach. Now, the one other difference you'll notice in the mouth is you, those of you close enough might see a little pink thing. That is something called this lingual lore. So lingual refers to the tongue. So that is his tongue. And with alligator snappers, it looks like a little worm. And the way they hunt is they sit in the water with their mouth wide open and they just wiggle the worm. And if you're a fish or a crayfish or even a small, pull them out. Don't mind me for a second, I'm just fixing his little anklets because he popped one off. We don't want you to fly away. There you go. Alright. So this here is Harry. And Harry is an Eastern Screech Owl. So he has been with us around four years now. And the reason he came to us is he was actually hit by a car, got lodged in the grill of the car, and then got stuck there for 15 hours. 
So I don't know if they hit him and go, oh, I hit a bird, and then went and parked and didn't go out to check. But miraculously, out of that whole ordeal, the only injury he sustained is he ended up losing an eye. Unfortunately, because it, uh, birds of prey depend so heavily on their eyesight, he can't go back out to the wild. So he now lives with us at Ark and is one of our ambassador birds. Now, Eastern Screech Owls are one of our most common owl species. They are in Pennypack Park, they're in Philadelphia, they're all over the place. However, how many of you have seen them out in the wild? Yeah. I gonna say, so even though they're super abundant, they're actually a very shy bird. So for starters, they are nocturnal. Does anyone here know what nocturnal means? Well, they, can, they do have night vision, but that means that they're awake at night, right? Yeah, so they sleep during the day and they're awake at night. And that's most owls, but another thing on top of it is they are not a very big owl. They are actually our second smallest owl. There is one even smaller, believe it or not. But um, because they are so small, they are actually on the menu for larger birds of prey. So stuff like red-tailed hawks or falcons. They don't want to be out during the day because that's when those predators are out. So they spend a lot of time hiding. You're most likely to see them poking out of a hole in a tree watching you as you're walking by. Now, owls are super adapted for hunting at night. So obviously they have those big eyes and that is to allow them to see in the dark. And their eyes are so big that they actually cannot move their eyes in their eye socket. So all of you can sit there and look ahead and then turn your eyes one way and the other without moving your head. Owls can't do that. So does anyone know how owls make up for that? Do you think they turn it all the way around? No, maybe not. No, their head would pop off. <laughs> they can turn it over 180 degrees though. So basically what that would mean if I was an owl and I was looking at you, without moving my body, I could turn my head all the way around and look at the trees behind me. Um, he kind of looks where he wants to look. He's actually, I don't even know, he's focused in on something right now. Are you watching someone? <laughs> He does look like a toy, but he's very much a real owl, I promise. Now, on top of their eyesight, there are times when it's even too dark for an owl to see. So that's when they use their other super sense, which is actually their hearing. So, where, so where do you guys think his ears are? So these things? We call them ear tufts, but those actually are just feathers. I can like literally put them down. So those are actually just for show. So what they do is they can move them up and down and that tells other owls what mood they're in. Because obviously owls can't smile or make facial expressions, so instead they just move those feathers around. So with them perked up right now, that just means he's very alert and he's paying attention to everything going on. Now, where his ears actually are, do you guys think birds have big flap ears like us? No. No. They have little holes in the side of their head. And owls are weird because if you were to take off all their feathers and look at their head, they've got one hole up here and the other hole's down near the bottom of their jaw. That's weird, right? Does anyone have a guess why they would have their ears arranged like that? Yes, so if they're sitting there, and they hear a sound, they can actually pinpoint what direction that sound's coming from because of if their ears are misaligned. On top of that, owls have a very funny face, face shape for a bird, right? They got that big round face. Those feathers around the face we call a facial disc and they act just like a satellite dish. And basically they funnel sound right into their ears. And some owls, their hearing is so sensitive that they can actually hear a mouse's heartbeat. Can you imagine like just sitting there and listening to a mouse's heartbeat? Now, that is even, it even goes as far as some of the larger owl species, like the uh, great horn owl and the great gray owl, and snowy owls. They can actually hunt rodents that are hiding underneath the snow in winter, just by pinpointing where they're crawling around. And they literally just dive down foot, feet first into the snow to grab them. So, does anyone have any questions at all 
about Harry or owls in general. Yes. Nah, I don't want to stress him out by moving him all over the place. He's being very well behaved right now, so I don't want to mess with him. Yes. No, so owls are uh, a protected species federally, so you cannot uh, legally keep them as a pet. Oh, he did he? Yeah. So you can't actually own them, and technically it's even illegal to own a feather. Yeah, so I'm going to say if you ever find an owl feather and you take it home, to, you know, don't tell anyone. <laughs> yes. Ah, so. Owls are what we call a bird of prey, and that usually refers to birds that hunt other animals, and their main weapon is their feet. So with owls, I have a really light glove because he's a smaller bird. I have another bird, I have a much thicker glove that you'll see soon. But... Alright, so this here, this is Windsor. Windsor is a red-tailed hawk. She is actually one of Ark's most long-term ambassador animals. She has been with us for 10 years. Now, the reason she actually came in, I remember I was, men I was uh, mentioning her vision. Windsor is actually completely blind in this eye. So if I go to this side, she knows. If I go to this side, nothing. So, she was uh, found grounded. She was very, very thin. And people are actually able, to, usually, if you're able to get a hold of a hawk, there's probably something wrong with that hawk. So people are able to get a hold of her and bring her in. Um, after she was with us for a bit, that's when we realized that she had vision issues. And the problem with that, with hawks, is they, vision is their number one sense. And basically, everything about them revolves around their excellent eyesight. So, you know, the term Hawkeye and Eagle Eye exists for a reason. They probably have the best eyesight in the entire animal kingdom. So not only do they have full color vision, but they can actually even see into the UV spectrum. So most birds in general can see into the UV spectrum. So they see, the way to think about that is they see colors that we mentally cannot even comprehend. Um, and they have really strong binocular vision and almost like telescopic vision. So like if you see a hawk flying around in the sky and you see like just like a little speck, he can see you perfectly down on the ground. And they do that while they're hunting. They can fly out and they can literally see stuff like mice and rabbits literally scurrying around through the underbrush from way up in the sky. Now, the binocular vision is something that animals have that when both their eyes face forward. So people have binocular vision. And basically what that does, and you see it a lot in predators, is it allows them to judge distance. So if you're a predator, obviously being able to judge how far away something is, is important if you're gonna run up and try to grab it. When you lose eyesight in one of your eyes, that depth perception is completely gone. So the comparison I tell people to try is like to aim at something and throw a baseball at it, and then cover one of your eyes and try to do the same thing. And you'll find it gets a lot harder to do that. Now, if you, that happens to you, that's like, okay, maybe I'm not gonna be as great at baseball anymore. For a bird of prey, that means I'm not gonna be able to catch food efficiently. And if she's not catching her own food, there isn't someone out there coming out to give her food. So, a lot of times when a hawk loses eyesight in one eye, that's kind of like an end of the road scenario for them. So, unfortunately, she could not go back out to the wild. And she's now been with us for the last 10 years as one of our ambassador birds. So, when Windsor came to us, she was an adult bird, and the way you can tell that with red-tailed hawks is the tail. So that red tail, they actually don't get until their second year. Before then, their tail is actually brown, which sometimes we've had people reach out and say, oh yeah, I saw a hawk that looked exactly like a red-tailed hawk that had a brown tail. That usually is what we call an immature red tail. So, they're not in the nest anymore, they're on their own, but they're not full grown yet. They're kind of at a teenage stage. 
and they're also the ones that tend to get in the most trouble. Um, we see a lot of them at the rehab. <laughs> um, she had a red tail when she came in, so what that tells us, she's been with us 10 years, she's at least 12. Now beyond that, you can't really judge once a bird is fully mature or how old it is. Um, do you guys have any other questions about winter at all? Yes. Ah, well, remember I was saying the hawks have really powerful eyesight? Part of that is them just having really big eyes. So we bring her out food. Um, now we can we can even toss her food. She's actually pretty good at catching it, but that's a little different than like flying around and catching an animal that's darting and weaving. What's the most so we'll take her out and basically she does training. Why, why is she trying to fly? Why is she trying to fly? So that's something called baiting. Um, birds of prey will do that sometimes when they're on the glove and it's basically just, their instincts tell them not to just sit in one spot for too long. So eventually they're like, okay, I want to move. And they just kind of fly around and reposition themselves. Why, why is she trying to, why is she trying to move to grab the spot? That's just something they do. All right, hey, next question. Are they so strong? Yes, yeah, so the reason I'm wearing this glove is their feet are extremely, extremely powerful and those talons are really, really sharp. Um, hawks, that sharp beak is actually only for eating food. They actually take down their food with the feet. And their feet are actually so strong that if they were actually to grab you, you can't get them off you until they decide to let go. You're physically not strong enough to pull their toes off. So, it's important when we handle them, we got these big, thick, heavy leather gloves, because even if she didn't mean to, it could literally just be her getting spooked and clenching her feet a little bit, and she would, like, really hurt you. All right, any other questions at all? Why does she have long, why does she have long legs? Well, she has long legs because she, that's what she uses to catch her food, her feet, right? And if she grabs another animal, do you think that animal wants to get eaten right away? No. No, so if she had really short legs, that animal would be right there and it would try to fight back. With the long legs, she could kind of keep herself far away from them. Now actually, I have a fun question. How much do you guys think Windsor weighs? Um, one... You know this already. <laughs> you, were, you were here last time. <laughs> do you have a guess how much she weighs? No? no? 50 pounds? <laughs> 39? 39? 40 million? 40 million? Mm -hmm. 4? How much did you guess? Okay, I'll take one last guess. Yeah, she weighs somewhere around 2, 2 and a half pounds. That's kind of shocking, right? She's a, she's a big bird, right? And that's because hawks and all birds are built very, very lightly because what do birds have to do? Fly. So she has hollow bones that lighten her weight and her body is actually full of these things called air sacs that are basically just big pockets of air in her body. And that makes her light enough to fly. But here's the thing, she weighs under three pounds, right? You see things online sometimes about people being posted like, hey, watch your dogs, there are hawks around. Do you think a two pound hawk can fly away with your 20 pound dog? No. No, the most a red tail can actually carry is somewhere between three and four pounds. And usually that's not very far, that's gonna be probably from the ground to a tree. So, unless you have a teeny tiny teacup puppy <laughs> chihuahua that weighs like a pound and a half, a red tail hawk is not gonna go after them. They're too big. We've actually had a hawk that came into Ark who, it was an immature hawk, so like I said, they're the ones that do silly things that get themselves in trouble. He decided to go after a dachshund. So like a, a wiener dog, like the big long dogs. Notice he's the one that went to a rehab. It did not end well for him. He made a full recovery, but he did not have a good time. 
Was the dog okay? The dog was okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> the dog was more than okay. <laughs> so. Um, I don't entirely know. It could have been something as simple as she was flying and caught her eye on like a branch or something. Or it could be she got in like a fight with another red tail and one, it like nicked her eye or something. Me. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Out there, yeah. <laughs> Get yourself situated. One thing that does happen with her sometimes is she is because she's blind to one eye, she doesn't see all of you, and then she'll will turn around, and suddenly all these people basically appear in front of her, so she'll get spooked. You want to switch up? Really protected, so people can't touch them. So it's not going to be that much for a red tail. Because we have a turtle out there. I feel like I I knew it. I want I think it's somewhere around two hundred. I want to say it's somewhere around two hundred. Two hundred. I could try to I because I. All right, take care. This was good. Can I take her picture? Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank